In the Canadian Forces, we train as we fight. That means to simulate in training as closely as possible the conditions encountered in the real world. This video deals with the use of various pyrotechnic munitions. Some of these are used in both training and operations. Others are used for training only. The pyrotechnic munitions covered in this program are smoke grenades, the parachute flare, and the trip flare, and two battlefield training simulators, the thunder flash, and the ground burst simulator. Knowing how to correctly function a munition is important, but so is knowing where and when. In this video, you'll be shown approved methods of functioning these items, as well as various safety considerations inherent in their use. Canadian Forces pyrotechnics and ammunition are safe when used properly. However, the training environment is complex and dynamic, and while none of the items covered in this program is designed to kill, their use entails risk, even when they function as designed. There are risks associated with pyrotechnics when they fail to function, so this program also includes information about misfires and duds. This includes two mandatory systems of reporting, by CF-410 Ammunition Defect and Malfunction Report and to the local range control organization. Procedures may vary from base to base, so always check your local range standing orders and standing operating procedures before using these munitions. This program covers the appropriate inspection requirements when unpacking or taking possession of pyrotechnic munitions. Remember, damaged items are never used. They are reported and returned or properly disposed of and never attempt to modify these or any other munitions. Finally, when operating these items, the use of ballistic or other protective eyewear is highly recommended. Smoke grenades have a variety of uses in both operations and training. The L83A1 smoke hand grenade is used to screen positions and movements. The L83A1 are bagged and packed 48 to a box. The body of the L83A1 smoke grenade is green. It's about 13 centimeters long and 6 centimeters in diameter. Note the fly-up lever which holds a cocked striker in place. When the lever is released, it rotates away from the body, releasing the striker and igniting the smoke composition. There is no delay element. Note the safety pin which holds the fly-up lever in place. When unpacking or taking possession of an L83A1 grenade, ensure this safety pin is securely in place. The L83A1 smoke grenade is deployed by hand. Firmly hold the grenade and fly-up lever with your throwing hand. Twist, then remove the safety pin and throw the grenade. When thrown, the fly-up lever releases the striker. Initiation is instantaneous. Step 1. Grip the grenade and fly-up lever firmly in your throwing hand. Step 2. Twist and remove the safety pin. Step three, throw the smoke grenade. Smoke grenades spew extremely hot gases and particles, the bright area in this enhanced image. When using the L83A1, do not release the fly-up lever before throwing the grenade. Remember, there is no delay element, and when ignited, the grenade becomes extremely hot. In high concentrations, the smoke is toxic, so while there is no lethal radius for this device, it should not be used in confined spaces or where there's the possibility of prolonged exposure. 
The majority of accidents involving smoke grenades occur when individuals pick up or disturb what appear to be a dud grenade. If you encounter a dud or misfire, do not touch it. Mark the item in an obvious manner, record the location, and report the dud or misfire to your supervisor or range safety officer. The C8 colored smoke grenade is typically used as a wind drift indicator to mark a target or as a signaling device. This is the standard packing for the C8 grenade. Note the strip of tape indicating the color of the smoke. The body of the C8 grenade is light green, about 12 centimeters long and 6 centimeters in diameter. The cap is the same color as the smoke produced purple, green, red, or yellow. Under the cap is a striker mechanism. Pulling the cord causes the actuator to cock and then release the striker. The striker ignites a delay element, which in turn ignites the smoke composition two to six seconds later. Smoke emission lasts approximately 40 seconds. The C8 grenade is deployed by hand. Hold the grenade firmly in your throwing hand. Undo the tape around the lid. Unscrew the cover and extend the cord. Pull the cord firmly to operate the actuator. Throw the grenade immediately. Step 1. Hold the grenade firmly in your throwing hand. Undo the tape around the lid. Step 2. Unscrew the cover. Extend the cord and pull firmly. Step three, immediately throw the smoke grenade. The cap of the C8 colored smoke grenade should remain firmly in place until just before use. Smoke grenades spew extremely hot gases and particles, the bright area in this enhanced image. As well, the body of the grenade becomes very hot. Throw the grenade immediately after operating the actuator. In high concentrations, the smoke is toxic. So while there is no lethal radius for this device, it shall not be used in confined spaces or where there's the possibility of prolonged exposure. In 2008, 14 members were injured by smoke inhalation in this tunnel. The majority of accidents involving smoke grenades occur when individuals pick up or disturb what appears to be a dud grenade. If you experience a dud or misfire, do not touch it. Mark the item in an obvious manner, record the location, and report the dud or misfire to your supervisor or range safety officer. The parachute flare is a lightweight illuminating device used for nighttime operations and training. Its efficiency depends on terrain and wind. It is usually launched in multiples. C7 parachute flares are packed in a metal box, 24 flares to a box. Each flare is in a barrier bag. The plastic barrier bag should remain sealed until the flare is ready for launching. The launching assembly is olive drab with white markings. It is 33 centimeters long and just over four centimeters in diameter. The launcher consists of a launching tube and a rotating handle. A rubber cap seals the launching tube. Inside the launcher is the rocket assembly, which includes the candle assembly and the parachute. You will not normally see the rocket and candle assemblies. They are shown here so that you can identify them should you come upon either one. Do not touch either the rocket or candle assembly. To fire the C7 parachute flare, remove and discard the plastic barrier bag. Do not remove the rubber cap. Hold the rocket at arm's length and point the tube up at 45 degrees in the direction of launching. Unlock the safety slide by holding the launcher in one hand and using the other to rotate the safety ring until the marking F snaps in place directly above the safety slide. Pull the safety slide down. Rotate the handle left as indicated, approximately one quarter turn until ignition. 
Note that while the safety ring can be rotated in either direction, the handle must be rotated to the left. Step 1. Remove and discard the barrier bag. Step 2. Hold the rocket at arm's length and point the tube up at 45 degrees in the direction of firing. Step 3. Unlock the safety slide by rotating the safety ring until it clicks into position with the F above the safety slide. Step 4. Pull the safety slide down. Step 5. Rotate the handle to the left to ignite. Misfire! In the event of a misfire, continue to point the parachute flare in a safe direction for a minimum of 30 seconds. Then, while still aiming the flare in a safe direction, rotate the handle to the left about a quarter turn until the safety slide aligns with the recess immediately above the rotating handle. A single click is heard when the safety slide is in the correct position. Warning! Over-rotating the handle causes the firing pin to recompress and release against the percussion primer. This could fire the flare. Again, ensure the flare is always pointed in a safe direction when performing the misfire drill. Rotate the safety ring until the marking F is above the safety slide and push the safety slide forward to a complete stop against the safety ring. Turn the safety ring until the marking S snaps above the safety slide, locking the safety slide in the forward position. After completing the misfire drill, the C-7 is safe for disposal in accordance with local procedures. Step 1. Continue pointing the flare in a safe direction and wait a minimum of 30 seconds. Step 2. Rotate the handle one quarter turn to the left to align the safety slide with the recess immediately above the handle. Do not over-rotate. Step 3. Rotate the safety ring until the marking F is above the safety slide and push the slide forwards to stop against the safety ring. Step 4. Turn the safety ring to S to lock the safety slide. After completing the misfire drill, the C-7 is safe for disposal in accordance with local procedures. Dud rocket assemblies and candles must not be disturbed. Both misfires and duds must be reported. The surface trip flare is designed to warn troops of nocturnal infiltration by the enemy without revealing the friendly position. When someone pulls, cuts, or stumbles on the trip wire, the flare ignites and illuminates the surroundings. When triggered, it fires immediately and emits an intense yellowish light for about 60 seconds, illuminating a radius of more than 250 meters. The C6 trip flare is packaged with mounting brackets, 40 per box. The box also contains nails and trip wire. The key components of the C6 are the mounting bracket, the illuminant assembly, and the cover loading assembly. The illuminant and cover loading assemblies are referred to as the flare. All components are olive drab in color. The trip flare incorporates a cocked striker held in place by a fly-off lever. The fly-off lever is held in place by a safety clip. A pull pin hangs from the safety clip. For shipping and storing, the flare is telescoped inside the bracket, with the fly-off lever held by a channel in the bracket. The bracket acts as a second safety feature during storage and transportation. When unpacking the C6, ensure the safety clip is in place and that the fly-off lever is held by the bracket. Also ensure that the cover loading assembly is not loose. If it is, do not try to refit it and do not use the flare. The mounting bracket acts as a clamp for the flare. The bracket assembly also holds the trigger assembly, which consists of the trigger, trigger pivot, a spring, and a washer. The lower end of the trigger has a hole for attaching the trip wire. The upper end of the trigger has a tongue that keeps the fly-off lever in place when the flare is armed for pull-release activation. 
There are four steps to using the C6 trip flare. Plan, inspect, install, and arm. Know where you are going to install the flare, how it is to be mounted, and the method of actuation. Examine the safety clip to ensure correct assembly to the holes provided for it in the cover loading assembly. Inspect the pull pin for straightness. Inspect the cover loading assembly for corrosion or looseness. Do not attempt to tighten or reassemble a loose cover loading assembly. This may cause the flare to function. Inspect the flare and bracket for deformities. Inspect the trigger spring for proper tension and position. Rotate the trigger counterclockwise. When released, it should return to its starting position. Common installations include nailing to a post or fence post, wiring to a stake, or clamping on a post. Whichever method is selected, the bracket must be firmly anchored in as vertical a position as possible. It must also be installed so that the wire will run out in a straight line on the same axis as the pin, or in the same plane as the trigger rotation. If nailing the bracket to an object, loosen the wing nuts and remove the flare by sliding it upwards through the bracket. Set the flare aside. Mount the bracket using the two nails provided. Insert the flare into the bracket so that the fly-off lever will clear the bracket. Too much clearance and the fly-off lever may slip out of the trigger when the safety pin is removed. Use the trigger as a guide. With the flare inserted in the bracket, tighten the upper wing nut to firmly grip the flare. Note that the safety clip is now the only safety mechanism. How the flare is armed depends on the method of functioning. The flare can be armed for pull pin or pull release functioning. For pull pin arming, the flare is functioned when the tripwire is pulled, either on command or accidentally by the enemy. Fasten one end of the trip wire to a post, stake or other rigid object and unroll the wire back to the flare. Pull the trip wire taut and fasten it to the loop in the pull pin. Press down and hold the fly-off lever with one hand and remove the safety clip. Be careful not to release the lever. This will function the flare. Insert the pull pin attached to the safety clip through the two safety clip holes in the cover load assembly. Ensure the pin will slide out in the direction of the wire. Carefully release your hold on the lever, making sure the lever holds the pull pin. The trigger is not used for pull pin arming. Ensure the trip wire is sufficiently taut and fastened at both ends. Step 1. Fasten the trip wire to a post, stake or other rigid object and unwind the wire to the flare. Step 2. Pull the trip wire taut and fasten it to the loop in the pull pin. Step 3. Hold the fly-off lever and remove the safety clip. Step 4. Insert the pull pin through the two holes in the cover load assembly. Step 5. Carefully release your hold on the lever making sure the lever holds the pull pin. Step 6. Ensure the trip wire is taut and fastened at both ends. With pull release arming, the flare will function if the wire is pulled or cut. Fasten one end of the trip wire to a post, stake or other rigid object and unroll the wire back to the flare. This anchor should be to the right of the flare when facing the trigger. The flare must be mounted so that the wire is at right angles to the axis of the trigger. This ensures that there will be no binding between trigger and trigger pivot when the trigger is cocked. While leaving the safety clip in place, press the fly-off lever down against the flare body with one hand. With the other hand, rotate the trigger one quarter turn counterclockwise against the tension of the spring so that the trigger tongue slides over the fly-off lever to hold it in place. Feed the trip wire into the hole in the lower end of the trigger. Pull it taut and fasten it to the trigger. Check to ensure the wire is taut, the trigger vertical, and the fly-off lever is held by the trigger. 
While holding down the fly-off lever, carefully remove the safety clip. Carefully release your hold on the fly-off lever, making sure the lever will be held in place by the trigger tongue. The flare is now armed. Save the safety clip for use in disarming the flare. Step 1. Fasten the trip wire to a post, stake or other rigid object and unwind the wire to the flare. Step 2. Press and hold the fly-off lever against the flare body and rotate the trigger one quarter turn so that the trigger tongue holds the fly-off lever in place. Step 3. Feed the trip wire into the hole in the lower end of the trigger. Pull taut and fasten. Step 4. Check that the wire is taut. The trigger vertical and the fly-off lever is held by the trigger. Step 5. Hold down the fly-off lever and carefully remove the safety clip. Step 6. Carefully release your hold on the fly-off lever, making sure the lever is held in place by the trigger tongue. The flare is now armed. Step 7. Save the safety clip for disarming. To disarm the C6 trip flare, carefully depress and hold the fly-off lever against the flare body. If the flare is armed for pull pin functioning, remove the pull pin and then secure the lever by inserting the safety clip into the safety clip holes. Then detach the trip wire. If armed for pull release functioning, carefully depress and hold the fly-off lever against the flare body. Then reinsert the safety clip saved during arming. Then detach the trip wire. In the event of a misfire, wait a minimum of 30 minutes before approaching the flare. Only a misfired flare armed for pull pin functioning can be disarmed, and only if the pin is still in position. Visually inspect the flare without disturbing it. If the pin is still in position, disarm the flare. All other misfired flares must be marked and reported as a dud. Avoid setting a trip flare near dry trees or other flammable materials. Do not attach it to a vehicle or building. When using pull-release arming, avoid kinks or bends in the trip wire. They may straighten after installation and allow the trigger to release the fly-off lever. During training sessions, all personnel except those actually working on the flare should keep at least five meters away from the flare and trip wire. Also, make sure no one can interfere with the wire while the flare is being armed. The thunder flash is used to simulate battle noises during training or as a grenade simulator. The thunder flash is packed in a fiberboard box, 100 per box. Inside are 10 paperboard cartons, each containing 10 thunder flashes. Each carton is overwrapped in plastic. Thunder flashes should remain in the overwrapped carton as long as possible. The thunder flash is 21 centimeters long, brown with black markings. One end holds the explosives charge, the other is the handle. The igniter is protected by a cap, which is secured with tape. The presence of the tape is an inspection point whenever taking over control of unpackaged thunder flashes. The cap incorporates a striker composition around its lower edge. The thunder flash is deployed by hand. Tear off the tape and remove the cap to expose the igniter. Sharply rub the igniter across the striking surface. Throw the thunder flash immediately. When striking, hold the thunder flash so it doesn't point at you or anyone else. There's about a seven second delay. However, this delay may be shorter. The thunder flash must be thrown immediately following ignition. Step one, tear off the tape and remove the cap to expose the igniter. Step two, sharply rub the igniter across the striking surface. Step three, throw immediately.
Do not remove the tape until ready to throw. The tape is a safety device and also protects the fuse from moisture. The thunder flash ejects a small sub-assembly, creating a missile hazard out to a distance of 30 meters. Issued eyewear is sufficient protection from this hazard. The noise produced by a thunder flash can cause hearing damage out to 10 meters. A thunder flash should never be thrown within 10 meters of personnel. The effects are intensified in confined spaces. For this reason, a thunder flash is not used in confined spaces such as weapon pits, tunnels, or indoors. A thunder flash should not be used within 25 meters of volatile substances, equipment, or vehicles. If a thunder flash is accidentally thrown too close to personnel, they should be instructed to turn away, move away, and cover their ears. They should not try to touch or move the device. A dud or misfired thunder flash is destroyed by detonation where it lays, so it should only be used where this disposal technique is possible. Wait 30 minutes before approaching a dud or misfired thunder flash. Mark the item in an obvious manner. Record the location and report the dud or misfire to range control, your supervisor or range safety officer. The ground burst simulator is used to simulate artillery or mortar fire and to provide added realism to field training. It delivers a blast, flash, heat, light, and smoke. This device is often referred to as an arty sim, short for artillery simulator. Arty sims are packaged five to a cardboard carton, which is sealed in a plastic bag. Five bags are placed into a satchel carton, two satchels per fiberboard box, totaling 50 arty sims per box. An arty sim is 18 centimeters long and five centimeters in diameter. It is white with black markings. The simulator assembly is made up of an explosive assembly and a fuse igniter. Note that the fuse igniter and pull cord are protected by a plastic cap held in place by a steel safety clip. The presence of this clip is an inspection point. The RD sim is deployed by hand. Remove the safety clip from the fuse igniter and pull slowly to unwind the cord. Pull sharply on the cord to ignite the safety fuse and eventually the whistle charge. Throw immediately. Do not hold the simulator until the whistle is heard as the whistle may fail but the simulator still explode. The whistle is loud and will be heard for two to four seconds before the simulator explodes. Step one, remove the safety clip from the fuse igniter and pull slowly to unwind the cord. Step two, pull sharply on the cord which will ignite the safety fuse and eventually the whistle charge. Step three, throw immediately. This is a very powerful simulator. At 15 meters, it is capable of causing hearing damage. An arty sim should not be thrown within 15 meters of personnel. An arty sim is capable of severely injuring personnel or causing serious material damage. Its violence is such that gravel, sticks, and similar objects may be projected at high velocity. This produces a missile hazard out to 35 meters. Personnel within the hazard zone must take action to protect their face and other exposed body parts. When the general public is present, a safety distance of 100 meters is used. The RD sim should not be used in confined spaces as this significantly increases the effect of the explosion. The flash of the explosion may ignite dry grass and leaves. Do not pull out the cord in advance and do not fasten arty sims together either for carrying or throwing. A dud or misfired arty sim is destroyed by detonation where it lays, so it should only be used where this disposal technique is possible. Wait 30 minutes before approaching a dud or misfired arty sim. Mark the item in an obvious manner. 
record the location, and report the dud or misfire to range control, your supervisor or range safety officer. Canadian Forces munitions are safe when used properly. To use them safely, you must know and follow the authorized procedures. Each of the modules has addressed reporting of misfires and duds. It is imperative that they be reported to range control in order that they be safely disposed of. The unit must also initiate a CF-410 ammunition defect and malfunction report. This informs the life cycle materiel manager so that action can be taken to keep the munitions inventory safe for you to use and effective when you use it. Remember, do not attempt to carry out any modification or unauthorized disposal of these items. Doing so is a frequent and needless cause of injury. If you are participating in a class in which there is a display of pyrotechnic and training devices, the instructor should individually examine and prove each item as free from explosives, both to himself and to you. It is also your responsibility to prove each item is free from explosives before handling them yourself. <laughs>